Okay. Um, yeah, it's a good opportunity actually to uh, come somewhere other than Central St. Martin. So it's great to be asked down to Wimbledon. Um, as Chris said, I've got this long career of working across disciplines of art and design and applied art and craft and the last 15 years, uh, science. And so I, I wanted to use it this evening to do a couple of things really, to show some of the projects I've been involved in the last few years um, and to put them into some kind of context. Um, I want to show some historic examples as well um, in this kind of second half of the talk. Um, and then we're going to have a common conversation with Mark Fernington, uh, who's a reader in painting here, um, who I've known for some time, but we've never really had an, an opportunity to kind of talk much before. Um, and we have many different things in common. Um, and there's one of the things that um, I suppose by being aware of kind of historical tradition and working across disciplines, I become aware of what seem to be almost like unhelpful uh, hierarchies of practice that kind of see elements to do with illustration or applied arts as a kind of taxonomic subgroup uh, of a kind of lower value. And we might kind of unpick some of that as we go through. So I'm going to um, uh, breeze through quite quick some of this stuff. Um, I started working, uh, well, I had a microscope when I was 10, um, and I kind of rediscovered it at the end of the 90s. Um, and uh, I approached scientists at Kew with the idea of collaborating, working. I only got one reply, and that was from Madeleine Harley, who was head of research into pollen. And she had an early career in interior design. She had a really good awareness for the visual quality of the images that she was producing. In fact, she proposed doing exhibitions of her photographs at Kew, but actually it was perceived that there wasn't an audience for scientific images at that point. This is at the end of the 90s. Um, things have changed a bit since then. Um, she invited me in. She showed me her images of pollen, which are done on scanning electron microscopes, which were just sensational. And she gave me a half-day session on the microscope, and I started working sort of behind the scenes, really. And these are just a couple of images from that time, and the flower and the, and the pollen grain that it comes from. And the pollen grains are magnified about 2,000 times here to give you an idea of scale. Um, and one of the things that we discovered was kind of commonalities of language. Um, they would describe the kind of surfaces of pollen as having kind of sculptured features. Um, they would also describe kind of any bits of crud on the surface they didn't want as artifact, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, but also they would, she would select samples to show uh, what she thought was the kind of the specimen in its perfect sense. So it could uh, really kind of reveal the characteristics of each pollen grain in its best way. Whereas I was also interested in, um, this is a collapsed pollen grain, which had a very kind of vessel soft-like form, which, which appealed to me. Um, now this is, a, it, this is an important year, it's the 350th anniversary this year of the publication of Micrographia by Robert Hooke, who is a kind of uh, scientist, artist, uh, engineer, responsible f for a lot of the kind of redesign of London after the Great Fire, with Wren. And this is one of the first kind of books on microscopy. This is a very famous image which we're kind of familiar with now, a kind of a blow-up of a fly's head. And I think in its time it was very shocking. It was revealing something that people couldn't see, which kind of questioned their beliefs. Um, but apart from just that, I was looking actually recently at the preface of the book, and I'll read that out because it's quite hard to read. And it just says, it's the prerogative of mankind about other creatures that we are not only able to behold the works of nature or barely to sustain our lives by them, but we also have the power of considering, comparing, altering, assisting, and improving them to various uses. And as this is the peculiar privilege of human nature in general, so it is and so is it capable of being so far advanced by the helps of art and experience as to make some men excel others in their observations and deductions. So he really um, valued and was aware of the power of the image. Interestingly, he was also one of, the f he was one of the first people to conduct practical experiments as demonstrations at the Royal Society. Um, and that was at a time when natural philosophy was emerging 
Uh, and the natural philosophers were very suspicious of images. And there are kind of re reports within the kind of annals of the Royal Society of, of distrust of images. So there was already a kind of slightly kind of schismatic uh, <coughs> approach and, uh, to different ways of describing, talking about, and revealing the natural world. And this is just 20 years later, it's a, a botanist, Nehemiah Gru. Uh, there was a fantastic book called The Anatomy of Flowers Prosecuted with the Bare Eye and with the Microscope. This is in 1682. And what's interesting about them is that they were fantastic bits of observation, but there's also a translation going on here. There's kind of types of stylization. Uh, there is an artist at work behind the microscope. And I think it's something I'm drawn to within my own work, the act of observing and transforming. Uh, as he would have put it, prosecuting with a bare eye and with the microscope. So this is just a glimpse of the kind of practice. Um, this is outside the studio. Um, and I'll work across lots of different media. And I might start off by doing drawings. I end up doing micrographic samples taken from the flower that the drawing was of. That's of a stamen with thousands of pollen grains. And <coughs> that's one of the pollen grains in the flower. Um, I'm a, aware of working in a long tradition. Um, this is a hand-coloured woodcut I bought um, in uh, Parma, in Italy, uh, two years ago. And it was from a big collection um, called the Medica Senese, um, which was also based on the kind of medical writings of Viscorides from uh, 1500 years earlier. Um, and I think it was a big volume, a big book, which had fallen apart and they were selling off individual pa pages. And I could afford just one. Um, and it's just, I mean, it appealed for two reasons. One, um, I just loved the way the plant is arranged as a specimen on the page, as it was, as it would have been like a herbarium specimen. But it's also a plant that I was familiar with, that I'd worked with. It's, uh, it's the wild uh, garlic. Uh, so that's it in its flower. And as it dries, it forms these kind of seed heads with three kind of little kind of seeds in each capsule. <coughs> if we take those apart and start to look at them under the microscope, we reveal these quite complex structures. And if we go in closer, we start to see the seed coat on the surface of those seeds, which has evolved to kind of expand and move and contract as the seed grows and uh, becomes desiccated. And in some ways, it makes me think of seeds of human generations kind of expanding within a confined territory. This is in Jaipur in India. And so I think it's one of the ways that I will look as an artist and make connections between the many different things that I work with. Um, there's a really good uh, science writer, Philip Ball, a whole series of books on flow and shape branch structures. They're great kind of science primers, um, particularly if you're scientifically challenged. Um, and in it, he makes this kind of one observation about Leonardo, and he said he had to sit and stare for hours, not to see things more sharply, but as it were, to stop seeing, to transcend the limitations of the eyes. Um, and again, this is something that I think I do. And all the different parts of what I do feed into the kind of final product. So this is a, uh, a Laxiflora, a wild orchid outside my studio. Um, excuse me, in the studio. This is in Greece, by the way. I'm fortunate to have a, uh, a, a bolt hole um, somewhere in the Ionian. Um, and what I'm, I found a way of working a few years ago, which was um, very quick and spontaneous and seem to capture something of the essence of the plants that I was working from. And I'm using Indian ink mixed with aniline dye. So I've got about four or five pots of ink there, each one with a different dye in, but all the inks look black. I'll have the plant alongside me on the table, and I just paint directly, uh, no pre-drawing. And I'll leave it for five minutes, depends how warm it is, and then I'll run it under the tap. I run off the excess, and some of the ink 
stains the paper. Some of the stain really kind of stains the paper. Um, it's partly chance and partly control, um, but it seems to capture something of the essence of that plant, almost as though it had been pressed into the paper. Um, and I think they take about five minutes, um, whereas some of the other images can take up to 100 hours. And I like that kind of contrast, and also the closeness to the material that I'm, I start working from. So I'm working through a series of lenses, I'm kind of lenses in my own eyes, and then I'm working with the lens of the camera to mainly to record and help identify. Um, it's another way of looking closer. You can start to realize that you're sharing this material with other participants in its life. And we can start to look even closer down the throat of this uh, butterfly orchid. And then using a kind of simple light microscope looking inside, you can start to see the hairs on the surface of the petal. These are the hairs by, by which the uh, insects that go inside help navigate around. And then if I take a section through the stem of that flower, you start to reveal the different cellular structures. And if I collect the seeds from that pollen, from the seeds from the, uh, from the orchid when it's dried, this is what they, sort of what they look like. And so this is a whole collection of, of pollen grains. Um, and I, I should say something about colour, because the question of colour always comes up. I mean, is this the real colour? And pollen does have colour, it has many different colours. And actually there are colour charts that beekeepers had have for uh, identifying what kind of plants the bees have been uh, harvesting from. Um, but within the process of electron microscopy, uh, your starting point is a black and white image, and then I reintroduce the colour. And the colour, I'll base it on the original plant colour, the flower, and, or other parts of the plant, and then I will start to bring out kind of functional characteristics that I understand from my knowledge of, the, of those pollen grains. And then finally I'll use it intuitively in response to the character of what each specimen uh, might convey to me. Um, these are after um, two, three years working with, with Madeline at Kew. And one of the, um, I was lucky to get a, a Nesta Fellowship, which um, gave me extra time there. And one of the things we did uh, was to do a book on pollen. Um, and uh, none of the, we, we, I put a, I, I've always done artist books you know, to accompany projects. So I put a book together and we went cold calling around the book fair and we approached Thames and Hudson and uh, Fyden and they all said, wow, these are great images, but where do you put it in the bookshop? Really? Uh, you know, is it, do you put it with gardening or photography? Um, there's not really a market for it. Um, and we both felt that um, the images are so powerful that they can appeal to very different kinds of people. And so we put a book together, which was all my images. I wrote some essays for it as well. And Madeline wrote all the scientific text. So whilst it looks like a heavyweight copy table book, um, it's actually a really kind of factual and visually um, powerful book. And seeds followed pollen uh, and fruit uh, followed seeds. Um, and then uh, they were translated into other languages. Um, and now I think, I think there's about eight languages. And so they've traveled around the world. And that's uh, created a huge audience, which I could never have anticipated or probably reached through my kind of conventional art practice. Um, and they're still in print, which is uh, pretty good after 14, 15 years. So. So, doing those books with Madeleine and with Wolfgang Stuppi from the Millennium Seed Bank, we could focus on, we didn't have to work in the same way that a scientist would work, you know, one particular family, kind of very detailed, one after the other. We could dip and dive and we could, we had to build up a narrative for the book, but we chose according to what we thought would work well in the book. So this is a um, nigella, flower to seed pod, to dried seed pod to one of the seeds. Um, and looking at characteristics, why 
they have different different kinds of surfaces. Nigella, it's a kind of it's a, like a poppy pepper pot. You know, they're going to be thrown out into fairly rough ground, so they've evolved to withstand a fairly rough treatment, and they've got a sort of armour coating. Um, Part of the interest is also looking at why they kind of form like that. What are the, what are the uh, genetic processes which define why it's going to build those ridges? What's causing the cells to generate too quickly in certain places so they uh, buckle up? There's not enough space for them to kind of fit in. Um, this is a cactus seed. And the coating on that seed, which is kind of sh shrink-wrapped, and then looking at dispersal mechanisms. I mean, the books are my dispersal mechanisms. Um, this is a um, anagalis, which is a scarlet pimpernel. Um, it has a little cap with a little point on the top. And that's when that's triggered, it, the cap splits in half. And it just kind of throws all the seeds out pretty much in one go. This is from a plant from, us, uh, from South Africa called Blepharis. And this lands on the ground. It just stays there until it gets wet and it explodes and it sends out these runners which will then end up forming kind of roots. Then there's kind of hook mechanisms, claw-like hook mechanisms. And these are all quite small specimens. So this is only about three millimeters long. It's um, a Hakalia seed. And that's a cremaria. Um, and when I was talking about the colour, talking about this here, the, this is a sand milkwort on the left and a cornflower seed on the right. And the, the colouring came from the plant. The, in the middle, you've got this green embryo of the seed. Uh, and at the bottom, a bit hard to see, but it's uh, what's called, an, in botanical terms, an eliosome, which is ant food. It's where the ants take away and consume and then reject the rest, so that the kind of seed can be blown further on its travels, relieved if it's anchor. So there are many kind of wind dispersal mechanisms. It's an Australian seed, a kind of daisy, a daisy plant. It's kind of the original green man. And then there are these complex lace-like structures. This is a hemameris. And one of the things. Um, I failed quite a lot of subjects at school. Um, all the science subjects I failed, and I, didn't, I did a bit of Latin, but I didn't even get as far as taking the exam. Um, so uh, I happened to learn a lot of different things by working with scientists. So learning the Latin names became more important um, as we worked from plants from around the world that don't have common names. Um, and it's, I'm getting to the point now where I can only remember the Latin name and not the, the common names. Um, but the Latin name tells you something. It tells you where it came from, or who discovered it, or what its structure is, or if it flowers at night. So it's another kind of language which enriches my kind of uh, study of the material. This is a Nemesia. Phenomenal complexities within the, within the form. And this is a Simicifuga, uh, which looks like a an exotic piece of kind of jewellery, really. And the uh, scabious from the mountains in northern Greece. Um, one of the conversations you have when you're kind of working with scientists, um, we did a similar seed for the seed book, and it was the other way up, because that's the way you would present it, and I kind of, at botanically, and so I went along with that. And then I was developing this image of my own, I thought, actually, it makes more sense if it's this way up. It is a parachute seed. It's meant to kind of carry through the air. Um, but it has a very kind of balletic feel with this kind of um, bodice above. And then looking at fruit, this is a Japanese wine berry. So from the outside, we look at the surface. This is the surface of a peach. Uh, the kind of hair that you feel, the kind of bloom that you feel on the surface of a peach or the, the wax that you feel on the, on, you can sense on the sur surface of a myrtle. These are kind of waxy, waxy platelets. 
And then we can look at leaves. Um, leaves are coloured in, covered in fine hairs, stellate hairs. This is a uh, Eliagnus. And uh, a viburnum. Each family has kind of characteristic similarities. And that's a wild pair, much hairier. And, and the looking becomes uh, quite obsessive. This is a, a fig, it's a, quite a small, it's a, it's a shaggy leafed fig from Asia. It's a bit bigger than a pea. Um, this is in one of the greenhouses in Kew. And if you cut it in half, you can start to see on the inside what it's like. And a fig is, we term it as a fruit, but actually it's an enclosed <coughs> inflorescence. So inside there, it's all the stamens with all the pollen. Um, so the plant needs a pollinator. It needs another collaborator. <coughs> and this is the fig wasp. It's about two millimeters long. It burrows up through the aperture at the end of the fig and the male and female mate. The female lays it, the eggs. And when the young are born, the male are wingless. They can't get out. They cut the holes for the females to get out and then they die. And the female flies off. Um, and she's carrying with her the pollen to the next fig. So next time you have figs, uh, look closely. They're tiny little black specks. If I've done one thing today, next time you eat a fig, I bet you kind of look really kind of closely. Um, this is, uh, um, uh, on the left, it's an ant's refuse tip. So these are, again, this is out in Greece, uh, phenomenal... Um, insect, the ant. I mean, they're just uh, such a kind of social, socially well-organised um, being. Um, and I just thought it's useful to show you a little bit about how I do these. The reason I do this um, is um, when I'm asked about colour, I say, it's not the, no, that's not the original colour. So people might say, oh, it's false colour. And false colour is a term that scientists use. Uh, they'll have colorization programs to change the colour of their specimens. And they can do it for a variety of reasons. It'll bring, they, can, they can set different filters, so it'll bring out different structures, different uh, chemical qualities. Um, but the, it's defined by the program. There's not much room for intervention. And actually, uh, they're not allowed to intervene too much for scientific reasons. Um, so I do this uh, often if I'm talking to scientists to show how I do it. And it's not just push button. Uh, it, I describe it as being a kind of handcrafted Im image in a digital environment. So this is one of those seeds. It's a medicargo, uh, it's a medic. Um, and you coat the seed with platinum or gold. And you then put it in a vacuum chamber and bombard it with a beam of electron particles. And that will give you a series of photographs. And because it's quite big and the electron microscope is meant for taking very small things, you can't get the image in, in one go. So this is how it's done. It's built up of a number of <coughs> frames, which I then manually reconstruct. There's no real kind of tricks. It's just um, sophisticated use of, of Photoshop. And then cleaning up the backgrounds to get rid of any crud, to repair any broken tips, by maybe cutting and pasting, moderating the kind of tonal values to really bring it forward, and then introducing colour layer upon layer. And it's the same kind of sensibility that I would use on a graphic tablet as I would if I'm painting with a brush or with pastels. And Medicargo is a big family, uh, 80 or more, and they all, all the seeds have the similar kind of familiar characteristics of a spiral. Some are smooth, some are spiky. Um, that's the largest. That's about five millimetres across. Um, in 2000, I was invited to the Gulbenkian Science Institute in Lisbon, which was a 
um, quite a dream ticket, really. Um, I had three months, which became five months, to work in the labs there, and I could work with whoever I wanted and do whatever I liked. Um, and Lisbon is a great place for ceramics, if you like uh, tiles. It's a cellular city, um, and there's a nice kind of uh, relationship between the things that they were looking at under the microscope and the things that were surrounding them on the walls, which they hadn't noticed. That was part of my role, was to kind of um, open their eyes a little to the things that were around them and the material that they worked with. So this was the lab that I worked with, typical lab. Um, and I had wanted to use a particular kind of microscope, but it became too difficult, too competitive, really. Um, so I found just a basic light microscope in the corner that no one was really interested to use. And um, I started cutting sections from wildflowers, just with an ordinary uh, cutthroat razor blade, about half a millimetre thick. Uh, and the colour this time comes at the beginning of the process. So I'm using histological stains, which are the traditional stains you use, some of them aniline dye stains, and they use them for staining specimens to show different types of tissue in the plant. Um, so this is um, it's a section through, um, again, wild garlic. And you can, it's, it's the outer cell wall. And the stain is changing colours according to the different proteins. Part of it is naturally coloured. And you can see the chloropass, there's little green buttons inside each cell. And so I take multiple frames and build up an image which, um, the final image is about that size, that's about the actual size. Um, this is a primrose, just one hair uh, on the side of the stem. And marigold. And these are all stained with the same stain, but the plant responds very differently. So this is made of about 600 images. Um, and the reason I do that is because I'm working a different way to the scientists. They would use a high magnification to show a small detail and a low magnification to show the whole thing, and that would be good enough for a, a publication to show A4 or maybe for a poster. Um, but that, I can show it four metres across at actual size, um, which was quite... A um, it was quite interesting to see how the scientists responded because they hadn't seen it in that, that way before. Uh, and to look at the different types of cell shape. And one of, the, one of the reasons I was invited was through my association with ceramics that I've worked on in the, in the past. Um, and I spotted this in a magazine uh, and it's, the, it's inside the French embassy in Lisbon. And it's, it's kind of ceiling, uh, pyramidal shaped ceiling, which is lined with 18th century blue and white plates. It's a kind of potter's gateway to heaven, I think. And it survived several earthquakes. Um, and so I just like the kind of grandiose scale and ambition. So I did a project with a Portuguese manufacturer to develop a whole series of, to use my images to develop this whole, oh, went up in there. <coughs> Sorry. Um, whole, uh, tableware collection. And the plates were kind of slightly odd shape, this kind of cellular base shape plate. And we used them in a conventional sense to eat off. So I used it at the end of my time there uh, for a, for a uh, sort of gastro feast, with, working with some chefs. But I could also, I also used it to invite people whose paths don't always cross. So the Minister of Science uh, and uh, the curator from the art museum there uh, and students uh, and artists. Um, so I, so I, the plates became a conduit for bringing people together. And I also used them in a different way. So one of the groups I made had a hole through, through which I could place fresh flowers, which were supported in a kind of laboratory flask at the back. It has a very beautiful mural on the end of this wall, with kind of scientists. And behind you can see all this kind of equipment. And it was in a, it was for a special one-day event. Um, International Plant Fascination Day. Um, and uh, the table, it's in a, an Institute of Agricultural Science, which was actually going to close down, I think, for lack of funding. The table was covered with old microscopes. Uh, and I think one of the things I enjoy doing is uh, unexpected encounters with work. 
So where you don't expect to see it. So the, the, the table can no longer function as a table because it's covered in microscopes, and the plates can't function as plates because they've got holes in them. Um, finally, from this section, one project which, from an exhibition last year, this is uh, Forty Hall, which is a Jacobean house in Enfield, um, which is uh, tucked away. I never knew it was there until they asked me up. And I did a whole show which went throughout the house. And in doing the initial research, I found that the house was built in the same year as this, uh, this person was born, Anthony von Leeuwenhoek who really developed the first usable microscope. It's a tiny little thing with a bead of glass. Um, and he used it for looking at plants, but he really, he was a draper, and he used it uh, for uh, looking at samples of fabric and silk. Um, and the owner of the house at Forty Hall was a silk merchant. So there seemed to be a nice kind of synergy to bring my silks out to show within the context of that. To use the original panelling in the house to hang fragments of silk from, uh, and to hang them from the original kind of bars which would have had tapestries hanging down from them. I mean, it's interesting as a house because it um, has very little furniture inside. It's kind of, it has a multifunctional use. It's a public, public space. So the work, each room became a separate kind of little gallery space. One entered and, and was a passage through the building. It's kind of a series of unexpected encounters. Um, and this was an image from Sphagnum moss, so it's a cell structure of one of those leaves. Um, but they had a dining room, a beautiful dining room. So I created another dining experience. And I collected pollen from the flowers around the garden, which I printed onto a silk tablecloth, which was also printed with an image of itself, a magnified image of itself. And the plates were all either had uh, magnified images from the mulberry tree outside, or wood samples from that mulberry tree. So that's mulberry leaf silhouetted inside itself. And I used it as a project. It's quite hard to see. This is a, a project which uh, just finished. It's a five-year project, but the, it kind of finished last weekend uh, in, in Vienna. And it was... Uh, sometimes people ask what's in it for the scientist in, in its collaborations. Um, and um, it's not always easy to quantify. There's lots of different things that come out of it. But in this particular case, you can, I can actually put a figure on it, and it's 10 million euros. Because the scientists, there are 10 scientists from across Europe who are researching mitosis, cell division. And they'd applied, they'd had funding from the EU in the past, and they applied again, and they didn't get it, because there wasn't enough public access to their material. And so a curator, Marina Wallace from Artac, was brought in to develop a project. I think the scientists thought we were just going to illustrate their research, but that's not what we did. And this is a coming together at the end. And our brief was to make a short film, but we all made work as well. And we were teamed up with the scientists. So I was teamed up with Melina Shu, um, very bright cell biologist who runs a whole lab up in, at the MRC in Cambridge. Um, and we, we had a day there meeting, being filmed meeting, and discussing each other's practice and what's important to our practice, and trying to find out exactly what she's working on. She works on oocytes, which are eggs, mammalian eggs. And you kind of realise that image is just as important to her as it is to me. So for the scientist to get your image on the front cover of a magazine like Cell Biology is, a, is the equivalent to getting it on the front cover of Freeze magazine. Probably, well, about the same, actually. It has a, has a huge impact. So that's a kind of marker of, of the quality of your research. It's kind of recognition. Um, so that's something from the BBC, I can't match kind of, I haven't got a Freeze magazine cover to show you, but I've got the BBC uh, Spanish World Service website. <laughs> um, but, but we had a good conversation about colour. And on this, on, this is a, an egg, and this ring around the outside is called a zona pellucida. And 
Um, it means the zone of skin. It's, it ha it's, a, it's a zone which has to be penetrated by the sperm to fertilize the egg. But pellucida sounds like, to me, it had a kind of lucid ring to it, kind of clarity. And that was my starting point, for which I did a series of drawings, and from which I made a series of glass pieces in collaboration with a glass maker. And I made a, a number of works, uh, glass sculpture, but I also made a short film which put all those different aspects together. So I fused my images with uh, Melina's. And I'm going to show you a, sh a short clip to finish this section. Um, so those are four human eggs. Um, and there's a little bit of text I wrote to go with this. It said, an oocyte is the beginning of life. As with life, so it is with art, a moment of inception triggered by a fertile observation. Under the microscope, the intangibility of an oocyte belies its latent life-perpetuating properties. The crucible of molten glass in the furnace is likewise formless, radiating light and heat. It requires the eye of the artist and the hand of the craftsman working together through a process of alchemical genesis in pursuit of the realization of an idea. So in a pellucidus, the gesture boundary, a fragile skin that enfolds and yet is penetrated. It also speaks of lucidity, a transparency and a clarity of form and meaning and a point of contact between the arts and the sciences. And the film is a, a, a visual journey through uh, shared zones. And it's an attempt to capture some of the things which are hard to write about, um, that sometimes you do better through the making than you do through the speaking. At this point, I'm projecting her moving images of cell through the glass. There was an hour-long film of four 15-minute sections of the, of the different artists. It was myself, um, uh, Ackroyd and Harvey, uh, Lucien Jorge Orta, and uh, Shobana Jay Singh, who's a choreographer. So <coughs> that's um, Vimeo linked to those, those films. <coughs> um, just to conclude this section, there's one thing I'll do, which actually I've learned from the scientists. Um, that I work with, and they uh, always acknowledge who they work with because they can't do it alone, and they can't do it without funding. Um, and they see it; as they usually kind of name all their kind of research students that help them do the work. It's a combined effort, and those are just some of the people and agencies that have enabled me to do what I've been able to do. Um, I think it was about 12 years ago, I went to see an exhibition at the Natural History Museum. And it was Giles Ravel and Mark Fannington. Um, great exhibition. Um, really powerful, really, I think it was a really popular exhibition actually. It was, I mean, I went several times and it was always very busy when I went. Um, and shortly afterwards, I was reading a review. Um, and well, if you can read that, and it, I can't remember what newspaper it came from, but one of the things it said was, in, in the art world, illustration is a dirty word. It suggests slavish copying. It seems belonging to the world of functionality. And we all know art is at its best when it transcends functionality, when in short, it's useless. Um, and I thought that was interesting. 
and I didn't really agree with it. And this is another quote, and this is uh, by someone I did meet, and this is from the director of the, um, where is he from? Uh, from Berlin, director of the Natural History Museum in Berlin, and it's writing a book about natural history illustration. And he said, botanical illustrations have very little to do with art, but belongs rather to the realm of the sciences. Aesthetic considerations are wholly inappropriate, and beauty is a pleasant but wholly irrelevant side effect. Um, and I, did, I, I met him a few years ago, and I thanked him, but, you know, I told him I dined out on this several times. I mean, I said, um, and he's wrong. And the reason he's wrong is because he's only seeing it from the perspective of who he thinks they're going to use his images. And there are always audiences beyond your primary audience. And sometimes they can be as important. Um, and sometimes the works which are just deemed as illustration are very radical in terms of the way they are presenting the kind of subject matter. Like this fantastic um, painting by Lugotzi from a um, Florentine painter working for the Medicis. Um, and there are different uh, attitudes. This is a, an illustration by Cornel the artist Cornelia Hess Honegger. This is from 1991, um, Bug. What's interesting about it is it was collected from the Three Mile Island site. And so she was trained as a classical natural history illustrator. But she was recording um, what was happening to the insect. Um, and she's had quite a lot of opposition from natural history illustrators and, and natural historians uh, as to the legitimacy of doing something like that. It's quite interesting you say that because when I was working with this entomologist, George, Dr. George McGavin, um, at the Oxford uh, University Museum of Natural History, I mentioned her to him and he was completely dismissive because uh, 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 the way she worked didn't conform to his idea of scientific procedure. So the work had absolutely no impact on him at all. Yeah, it's very interesting, really. It happens more than we think. Um, and this is one of my favourite paintings, Great Piece of Turf by Dürer, which I thought I was going to see last weekend when I was in Vienna. And they had a reproduction hanging on the wall. So it was really... Um, Sad. Um, but it's interesting, it's an interesting time it's in, in, in relation to art and science. And it's talking about the imitation, the copying of nature in itself constitutes a kind of knowledge. Um, and it was influencing lots of different kinds of work. So this, which we see as quite an ornamental kind of piece of ceramics from, uh, what is it, 1510? 1590. Uh, Bernard Palissy, French artist, but actually uh, he was following along those lines of Dura. These are all cast from, um, well, I can say live specimens. They were once live, but they, were, they made, I mean, developed a whole kind of process for casting and moulding these into ceramics. So they were you know, very much at the forefront of um, developments within science and observation. And then there's this interesting character, which I only came across recently, Wenzel Jamnitzer. Um, he was an, in like all these people at that time, they did many things. He was an in instrument maker. He wrote a, a very kind of uh, important book on perspective. Um, and he also, uh, he tried to kind of, he, he was very influential in the guild of, of uh, technical studies for, for instrument makers and for jewelers. And he developed a way of casting live fresh plant material. So these are silver casts of plants. And these are, I'm not sure of the actual date, is it 15, 1540? Um, quite radical, really. I mean, and just in terms of technology and what they are as um, objects. I don't think I'll put the image in, but they're, they're also very reminiscent of the photographs of Karl Blosfeld from the 1920s in Berlin, who was also developing those as a, as a design resource for his applied art students. Um, I think it's interesting to compare it with this. This is uh, Walter Chinkel, who's an American zoologist from Florida State University. And this is a cast, an aluminium cast, of an ant's nest. So he goes out into the field with his gas tank, and lights up 
and he pours molten metal down into the ant's nest. So he can then dig out and reveal exactly what is there. Um, and they, uh, if, you know, if you go to his website, there's a whole collection of different shapes and sizes. They're quite astonishing, really. Um, so there are very nice parallels there within casting and um, verisimilitude. Um, th this, is, this is quite an important photograph. Um, it's from, 19, uh, from 1840, um, Andreas Ritter von Ettinghausen, um, and it's a section through Climatis. What was important about it is it's, it's really one of the first microscopic photographs. And why it's important is that was the point when the microscope and the camera were brought together. And what that did was that it put the, the photography into the hands of the scientists. So it kind of shut the door, really, on collaborations be between art and scientists for quite some time. Um, and it took, it took more than a century before that would change. So this is, uh, there, were, there were a few exceptions, but not many. Really. Um, but just coming back to this thing about attitude, this is one of my images of uh, an iris, a section through the stem of an iris. And this is a, a, school, a German school poster from the turn of the century, about 1900. Um, and this was uh, retrieved along with a whole collection of others similar. Um, it's, they're quite big, it's not quite that size. Um, but it was, they were retrieved from a skip in Pittsburgh. And they were thrown out of a science department because they were thought to be of no kind of real value. Um, so they're now in the collection of the... Um, I've forgotten the name of the collection. Uh, there's a botanical collection which is linked to the Carnegie Mellon. Um, and we're trying to set up an exhibition of those posters and, and my images alongside. But again, it's about, uh, about perceived value. Other kinds of approaches. This is... Um, by Arthur Harry Church, who was director of the Botanic Garden in Oxford um, and around 1900. And he, his main study was um, the sexual reproductive organs of plants. So lots of sections like this. There's quite a few in the Natural History Museum. They're really kind of beautiful kind of watercolours, really kind of rich. In some ways they're different, but in some ways they almost anticipate some of those poppy paintings of Georgia O'Keeffe. Um, but I just wanted to show you something of a young Japanese artist, Makoto Moriyama. I think he has an engineering background, so he's, he's using kind of engineering packages to construct images of his flowers. And they're, um, they're interesting. Um, but last, uh, last year at the Liverpool Festival, um, he was showing this piece of work. I'll get it to play. Um, come on. Yeah. So it's actually a projection. It's a, it's a magic carpet inside a blackened room. So you can animate the whole thing. So the plants themselves start to move uh, and the whole thing changes colour. I mean, the cycle lasts for about 10 to 15 minutes. From, um, so quite extraordinary kind of developments. We talk about art and science, but actually, I'm, I didn't say what I am. I'm also chair of arts, design and science for the University of the Arts. Um, and so we kind of think of art as one thing and science as, an, as another. But actually, within our art community, we don't always speak to each other. <laughs> so um, you know, there's lots to be learned, really. Um, and then, of course, there's Edward Cack and his hybrid flowers, genetically engineered flowers, whereby uh, you know, it, it, it expresses his DNA. So it's a bit of Edward Cack and, it's a, and a lot of the flower. <laughs> That's kind of making a point about engineering plants. This is a, a again, jumping back again, this is Nehemiah Gru. It's kind of formal mannered modes of presentation. Um, systematic kind of arrangements. And actually that's exactly what photography did. One of the things it did in the early days, this is um, by, uh, is it by? Uh, Charles Marvel, Marvel. Um, 
There are quite a lot of examples of, of early photography following the kind of presentation methods of, of uh, early botanical illustration. And of scientists discovering different ways of showing things. These are uh, radiographs of frogs from 1900. And this is a piece by Brandon Balanchy, Balanchy who, um, environmentalist, ecologist, um, engaged with biodiversity. He kind of, he, he positions himself really at, uh, his practice as a means of visualising scientific research and vice versa. Um, in a sense, it kind of also harks back to these kind of cabinets of curiosities in the 18th century, where they would kind of show, diff you know, animals with uh, one leg more than they were meant to have. Um, but he's using kind of the scientific processes of, of clearing the, the tissue and staining the uh, bones and cartilages uh, in different colours. Um, and it's part of a long project he's been working on. And they're very, very beautiful photographs, actually, very powerful. Sorry, Rob, is that a constructed animal? Or is no, that's, uh, that's a misfit. Okay. Yeah. So he's kind of looking, f he's, he's partially looking for that. I, don't, I mean, it's not, uh, what, one of the, I haven't got it here actually, but there's, um, one of the things they do in scientific research also, when you, um, you'll take, uh, when I was working at the IGC, um, they'll take an egg and um, the, when it's still an embryo, they'll take the top off. So the little kind of, the MA student will come in, she'll inject, say, the uh, one claw, of the embryo with a particular uh, gene which is going to not have an effect on it. And then they put cling foam over the top and then they put it back in the incubator for another couple of days and they take it out and she chops its head off and they chop the leg off and they clear it and they stain it and they prepare it like this is part of their research. They want to see, you know, the natural claw and the one, you know, you want to see how is it affecting the webbing and how is it, what's it doing. That's uh, standard uh, scientific practice. That's one of the things that, uh, it's one of the privileges uh, of, of being an artist, really. You, it does give you uh, a license to kind of open doors that are hard for everyone else to get into. And it's one of the privileges of gaining access to that, to challenge my own views of what I think is ethical or not, uh, uh, and to discuss that with the people who are involved in doing it. That's been really good. Just a, just a few more to complete. This is uh, Ramon uh, Santiago y Cajal, um, Spanish one, uh, doctor. He wanted to be a, an artist, but his father said you've got to be a doctor. Um, he went on to work with uh, the Italian Golgi, uh, and they discovered the Golgi, uh, which, is, which is an organelle inside. Uh, it's an energy-driving organelle within inside cells. But this is a drawing through uh, looking at brains and neurological tissue. Um, very beautiful pencil drawings. Um, oh, no, something's not quite right there. Well, it says, that's not what it says on the, on the bottom. Um, that's one of his sketches, and that's a drawing by Henri Michaud, uh, drawn under the influence of mescaline. So there's a kind of a, a nice kind of synergy between uh, Cajal's drawing sketches and Michaud's drawing done with a, a, a drug which is acting upon the very neurons that uh, Kaha was looking at. Um, and then there's a whole area of scientific illustration which has become very well known now through the work that the Welcome has done in kind of bringing a lot of this material out. Absolutely stunning uh, classic pieces of, of observation. And very moving as well. And there's the traditions of wax and wooden models of body parts. One thinks of the drawings of Stubbs, the anatomical dissections that Stubbs did to try and understand uh, what was happening. Um, kind of head by Mark Quinn. And the kind of fashion that the, the things come around, the, the things still continue to fascinate, and both the arts and the scientists still continue to kind of research and create work around those subjects. 
Uh, this is a kind of beautiful glass piece by Catherine Dowson, looking at it from the brain from the side, which is engraved into a block. So the technologies also allow us to kind of look at um, the same material from new perspectives. Uh, there, are, there, are, there are those people who were both artists and scientists, like Ernst Haeckel, whose books Art, Form and Nature still kind of sell in great numbers. Um, and they were influential in lots of different ways. That's, a kind of, that's from Paris. So that was a Rani Mbino, uh, so it's from the Paris exhibition. How those forms quickly uh, found their way out into the public domain. And still inspire artists like Tony Cragg, that's from the late 90s. And current designers using kind of 3D printing and model making techniques. Um, the 3D printing has been going on a long time. This is a, a balloon seed. Um, and if you look, you can see these kind of layers inside that honeycomb structure. Those are kind of layers of cellulose that are built up. Um, and of course, there's a kind of uh, paper wasp on the right. Oh, sorry. So we're still emulating. I mean, there's a lot of development within biomimicry, biohacking, synthetic biology, which are opening up different kinds of dimension. Um, and two weeks ago, I was invited as the, the guest speaker at um, International Congress of Botanical Microscopy, uh, which was a three-day meeting of um, very intensive presentations. Um, and it's just interesting to show you the kind of work that they're doing now. So this is somebody, this is looking through the, the wall of a plant and looking at the, the uh, I can't remember the name exactly, the name of it. it's, it's, it's a wall between the cell walls. And that's made from thousands of scans, which are built up into this kind of uh, three-dimensional movie. So they can start to investigate something which is mere microns in size to understand what's happening on the surface. <coughs> and They have a lot of expensive toys, I was going to say, or technologies. Um, but they use them for purpose, really. So that is a 3D print, so they have their own 3D printers. It didn't take them long to catch on to that. So they can 3D print microscopic, I mean, nanoscale material to really understand exactly what is happening inside there. Um, this is some work by Enrico Cohn, who works at the John Innes Plant Centre in Cambridge. Uh, and he's developed, he's very well known for working out how flowers grow genetically. He can say what happens genetically to make a flower that shape. So in very basic terms, if you think about a, um, a daffodil, the trumpet on a daffodil, why does it have a crinkly top at the edge? And that's because it's producing far too many cells for the circumference of the the opening on, on that daffodil. So it, it has to kind of crinkle up, it can't retain its form. Um, but, so they're looking at what happens genetically when um, the genes are switching on and off to produce or not to produce more cells. And so that affects the form. Um, and I've been working together on and off for two or three years and they 3D print their models and I tried working from those and I wasn't very happy with it, it was very literal. Um, but I, I did something trying to emulate those processes. So this is um, something I did with a, uh, the National Glass Centre up in Sunderland, uh, working with, I've forgotten his surname, it's Jim. Um, um, and what we're going to make here are some very long tubular cells. And it's done by, he's gathered uh, on his iron some uh, green glass and some white glass and some clear glass uh, and you stick it onto another iron and you start walking apart 
And what's interesting about that process is that it's not like a rubber band. It doesn't just get thinner and thinner and thinner in the middle until it breaks. The hot glass um, pulls off like toffee off the hot end. And when it gets thin, it, it cools very quickly and doesn't get any thinner. And uh, you can do the width of this room. It's quite extraordinary. <coughs> um, to pull at the right speed. And you can see there's a lot left. You can just see it pulling off the glass. And you can just see a different colour inside. Oop, not good time to come in. <coughs> um, so that's what it looked like. And then what we do, we start cutting them up into strips and then laying them out. And then those strips we put into the, into the glory hole, as it's referred to. Um, and what we do then is brings those out. He's got another piece of glass coming over here, which is a piece of red glass with white glass wrapped around it. And he's going to pick up those rods. Um, I'm going to shortcut. He does that several times until he can wrap it all the way around. And then he starts to add more glass to it and build it up until he can start to get it to the right kind of shape. And uh, I. I'm giving instructions here, um, like let it droop a bit more, or it's very much to do with timing and gravity. Glass making is a very skillful art. It's very hard to bullshit making glass. Um, I have made some pieces myself, and it's not easy. Um, I'm certainly not good enough to make these. Um, but what I was trying to capture was something of the, of the essence of what was happening in, those gr in the growth within those plant models that Enrico was showing me. And I think that's one of the things, you know, art, scientists often think you're going to translate things literally. And as an artist, we kind of go off on a slightly different tangent that brings another aspect to it. OK, finally, just to conclude. Um, it's an artist called Maria Sibylla Marion, who uh, both Mark and I uh, were familiar with. Amazing kind of, one of those kind of uh, eccentric kind of women, amazing women that went off around the world. I mean, she went off to Suriname. She <coughs> produced a huge folio of these botanical paintings of the plants of Suriname. Um, what's interesting is the way that she composes that. She's got the fruit, she's got the fruit half open, she's got the flower. Um, and in a way, what, it was a kind of precursor to those big uh, sort of 18th century kind of paintings where you've got a whole vase with every flower of, the, of every season in one vase. I mean, completely um, unrealistic, but they're trying to show off the kind of grandiose nature of the living world. And it's, it's also about metamorphosis, you know, the, the kind of relationship with the, the insect world, the butterflies, the moths what's devouring what. Um, and I just thought it was quite nice to end on a piece by Mark and a piece of mine. This is um, one of Mark's paintings. Do you know what's the title of that, Mark, is it? Uh, I think it's called Flirt. 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 OK. Um, very nice, uh, there's, a, there's a very nice little catalogue from the show that this was in, with an essay by Adrian Rifkin, and he describes these as nonsensical stems of incompatible flowers. So it was a really beautiful, concise way um, of, of describing that. And it was just quite nice to compare it with this piece of, well, not compare, but put alongside this piece of mine, which is a pygmy buttercup. It's about uh, five millimetres long, that whole stem. Um, but again, we have different scales. So the seed at the bottom has been enlarged 
about 10 times, and the pollen grains, obviously, about 2,000 times. Um, so I can show different, different forms of, of magnification within, um, within the plant. And we both have a kind of slight obsession with kind of taking our images and putting them in onto backgrounds where there's no contextual evidence to kind of help you kind of read it. You, know, you have to kind of find a different kind of way in. And I think that's probably quite a good place to stop.